Welcome everyone to the Accelerant Thought Leadership Series webinar. Today we will be discussing strategy execution with a balanced scorecard. My name is Joanne Brunn, the CEO of Accelerant, and I'll be your moderator today. In just a minute, I'll be introducing our guest speaker, but first I'd like to go through our agenda and just cover a few points. So I'll start the presentation with a quick overview of Accelerant and why we're including this important topic in our thought leadership series. And then we'll dive right into the main presentation where Jennifer Eversoll will be discussing strategy execution with a balanced scorecard approach. Then I'll present a brief wrap up and we'll answer any questions that came in during the webinar. So all of your lines are muted. If you'd like to ask a question during the webinar, please use the question box on the GoToWebinar panel. And we'll have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar, depending upon time. We'll answer as many questions as we can. And if we don't get to your questions today, we'll definitely follow up with you afterwards. So I'd like now to introduce our guest speaker, Jennifer Eversoll. Jennifer is co-founder and partner of Management Stack, which is an advisory and consulting firm. She's a graduate of Roanoke College, is a licensed CPA in the Commonwealth of Virginia, and a recipient of the Virginia CFO Award. Jennifer is a recognized industry expert in finance and organizational strategy, and we're pleased to have her back for her third presentation in our webinar series. And I know that some of you joined us live for her early, earlier presentations on the business benefits of employee engagement and creating and implementing effective internal controls. But if you miss them, you can watch them anytime on the resources section of the Accelerant website. So Jennifer believes that a great business strategy includes a thoughtful plan and the right tools for executing that strategy, effective controls to evaluate the execution, and a corporate culture of employee engagement. And that's a philosophy we share as well. Accelerant's cloud-based budgeting, forecasting, and reporting solution was created to facilitate budgeting as an extension of the strategic plan. And we believe budgeting represents an opportunity to engage employees and get their best thinking on how to bring the organization's strategy to life. And as the execution of your organization's strategy is the topic of the hour, Without further ado, I'll turn the presentation over to Jennifer. Thank you, Joanne, for having me back today. I think you mentioned that this is the, the third webinar that we've done that I've done in, in your thought leadership series. So I'm so happy to be back. And this is a topic that I get very excited about. We're going to talk today about balanced scorecard and how that uh, works in hand with strategy execution. So I'll go ahead and get started then. So shortly after um, my college career was over, I found myself in a rapidly growing service organization. So uh, we, I was on the fast track to management. I was so excited to be in the professional world. This was a, just a phenomenal new experience. So I was trying to soak in all of the knowledge and experience that I could possibly find. So uh, after about a year or so, I had all the confidence in the world and felt like I was just a business pro just ready to take on the corporate world. Then one day, one of my former business professors called and I was at a, a small private college, so we had you know, small classes and, and knew our professors very well. Um, but one day this pr particular professor called and asked me if I would be willing to put together an alumni group that would compete against his students in the college's business capstone course. So this was a business policy course where at the, you know, your last semester of college, you go through and basically create a business and start a small business. So every semester, these groups of students would compete against each other in a business simulation where you essentially, you know, run an airline. So every week you make decisions about your strategy, your marketing, sales, finance, IT, you know, across the board. And then a stock price is derived based on the airline's position in the industry. So the industry is obviously the other group's airlines. So this was the first semester that the professor had decided to add this alumni group. So he was trying to increase competition for the students. So I thought that was a great idea. And the airline with the highest stock price at the end of the semester wins. So the stock price over $20, if you made it that far, earned a spot on a famous wall of fame that's proudly displayed right at the entrance to the business hall. 
So I was so flattered to head up this inaugural alumni group, and I was really serious about this. This was my responsibility, and I was trying to show all these, air quote, young and inexperienced students how to run a business, because after all, I had been in the business world for a whole year and had all that experience under my belt, so clearly I knew more than they did. So I got busy recruiting the best and the brightest of my coworkers. I even got a couple of members of management to join the team. So I believed that we had this dream team. We were full of experts in all the critical functional areas. I got it all covered. We were motivated to win and we were ready to get to work. And I knew that we were gonna earn our place on the wall of fame. So fast forward a few weeks and our CEO called an unexpected meeting and he announced to us that we were being acquired by a large public company. Our new parent company had big plans for our service organization, and they let us know that we were all about to get very busy. Well, we had already made this commitment to the college, so in spite of all of those time constraints, we decided to push forward. We spent some time together over a few lunches, and we discussed the project over the next couple of weeks. Um, we had a vision. Our vision was that our airline was going to have the highest stock price at the end of the semester, but that's really all we decided. Beyond that, we really didn't discuss how we were going to do it. We just had our vision that we were going to win. Our stock price was going to be highest. So things got busier and we ended up working kind of individually on the project. We would make our decisions in the functional areas that we thought would drive success. But as it turns out, as you can imagine, our individual decisions were working against one another. One of us was entering markets that catered to leisure travelers, while at the same time, somebody else launched an initiative for business travelers. Someone in, um, invested in purchasing luxury airliners, and someone else slashed the fares to attract the more uh, cost-conscious passengers. So our disjointed methodology really quickly caught up with us, and at the end of the semester, our stock price was exactly 81 cents which has earned us the distinction of having the worst ending stock price of any group ever. Still to this day, I'm reminded frequently. So from that, I thought, well, I need to take something from this. This was a crazy experience. And, and after 20 years, I have learned more than I ever imagined from my experience in the business world. And I'm sure I have volumes yet to learn. I've worked with tons of companies, have studied companies who were able to articulate their vision and create a strategy and execute a plan to achieve that vision. I've worked with others who fell completely flat and even others who never even got close to their goals. So thinking back to the airline simulation, even to this day, I can draw some parallels to the real world and pull some really valuable lessons from my brief stint as the team leader of the alumni airline simulation group. So let's talk about some lessons that we can learn from that. A company's vision lays out what it would like to achieve. Vision statements, um, they should be aspirational and reflect the company's values and cultures, but you can't stop there. You also have to create a strategy that tells everyone how the company plans to get where it wants to go. There are low price leaders like Walmart. There are those um, with service as their differentiator, like Zappos is a good example of that, and others that value luxury, like Jaguar. It's important that you take the time up front and spend that time to figure out how exactly the company is going to differentiate itself in the marketplace. So that decision is what's going to chart the path for what strategic goals the company would like to set. So in our airline simulation, if we would have um, taken the time to do that, we could have succeeded as a leisure airline. We could have also succeeded catering to business travelers. But what didn't work was not making that decision up front. In the absence of a strategy to guide our path to success, team members were making decisions that in the end undermined the well-intentioned decisions of the other members. So a company's vision, whether it's short or long term, should not be tied to financial results. That's one very important lesson that I learned. All companies need both strategic and financial goals. There's no doubt that financial goals are important because whether you're making money so that you can continue to operate and grow or whether if you're a nonprofit, if you're making money in order to invest in your mission, um, it, it's still really important to have those financial goals. You can't just... Um, operate independent of those. 
And depending on where your company is in the life cycle, it may need to generate cash to reinvest in the company or pay off debt or launch new products, satisfy investors, whatever the case may be. But the vision cannot solely be tied to the financial goals because when resources inevitably become strained, because they will at some point in time, focusing on financial goals can inadvertently cause leaders to make decisions that sacrifice long-term success for the sake of the short term. Back to our simulation, our stock price wasn't a straight nose dive. So though our trend line continued to go south, we did have temporary spikes along the way. So there were weeks when the price would start to slip and because we defined our vision in terms of financial results, we made decisions that would trigger an immediate increase in the stock price. And that worked sometimes, but ultimately the upturns in price were all short term and didn't result in sustainable success. So the bottom line is there. For sustainable success, we need to be able to focus on the long term. So we need to know exactly how we're going to get where we're going, not just where we want to end up. So the next lesson that I learned is that, I'm sorry, is that vision is not synonymous with strategy. A company's vision lays out what it wants to achieve. So let's go back to um, the lessons in the, in the real world. So external factors are going to cause disruptions, so you need to be prepared for that. All companies face circumstances outside of their control, things like regulatory changes, shifts in consumer behavior, new competition, emerging technologies, and that's just to name a few. Um, that doesn't mean that companies can just bury their head in the sand and ignore the possibility of the unexpected. Risks require responses and responses require that decisions be made. Most of us from the front line to the C-suite today are knowledge workers, so those who think for a living. There was a time when most workers weren't required to make decisions about the work that they were doing. And as a matter of fact, they were often discouraged from making independent decisions and, and using independent judgment. Today, however, that's not the case. Independent judgment has, has, has replaced the, um, the way that we used to do things. Way back even in 1957, Peter Drucker predicted that the most valuable asset of the 21st century institution would be knowledge workers and their productivity. Today, we expect employees to make the best decisions to move the company in the right direction. So arming employees and leaders with a strategic plan that provides that framework in which to make the right decision is the best tool to have available when the unexpected becomes a reality. So this is where I'm, I, I've talked previously about employee engagement and how important that is. And that's a really important part of this particular statement because when employees are engaged and they know exactly what the plan is and they know exactly what the parameters are and they're empowered to make the decision they will make the decisions that move the organization in the right direction, but they have to have a little bit of information in order to, to know exactly what to do. So again, I have no doubt that our airline simulation would have ended differently had the unexpected outside event, which was resulted in some serious time constraints, had not happened. But that was completely out of our control. But it also could have turned out very differently if we had a strategy map in place that facilitated a more systematic and well, timely decision making that would have mitigated the impact of the event. So a strategy, even a great one, doesn't implement itself. So our airline simulation team, we were ambitious, we were motivated, we were capable, yet all of that drive and ability in the world won't lead to sustainable success without that clear vision and business strategy that is continuously communicated across the organization. Everyone needs to know a couple of things. First, they need to know where the company is going. So that, of course, would be that vision. And then they also need to know how it's going to get there, which is where the strategy comes into play. And there are different ways to create and manage a company strategy. And one of those ways that we'll talk about today is the balanced scorecard, strategic planning and management methodology. So just a little bit of brief history. Um, the balanced scorecard was created by um, doctors Robert Kaplan and David Norton, and it was in the 1990s. That's when they actually coined it, although the roots go back many years. It began as a way to have a more um, balanced view of the organization 
and its performance. So they wanted to look at more than just the financial measures. They wanted to go back and see what are the non-financial measures that are indicators of where the company is going to end up. So this concept was originally um, originally founded or, or intended for um, for for-profit companies, for the business world, for, for those organizations, but it can so easily, and, and it, it's a valid exercise to apply this to any type of organization, nonprofits, um, educational institutions, healthcare, government, across the board, it's been implemented globally by, by many, many, many organizations and, and very successfully so. So Drs. Kaplan and Norton, their original concept um, of the performance, looking at performance across the organization, eventually grew into a much larger strategic planning and, um, and management methodology. So it views success from multiple perspectives across the organization. So the, the balance scorecard term really comes from you're balancing your leading indicators and your lagging indicators. So you're not just looking at financial results, you're looking at the non-financial results and things, but also viewing success from multiple perspectives across the organization. And we'll get into a little bit more detail about that. So it provides much more than a method for just documenting a strategy. It really is an entire framework for, for executing it. So this is not just a document that you create and put up on the shelf. It's something that you, you really live by. It's a living, breathing document that you live by, that you consult, that you continuously update. So it's a, it's a large undertaking and really has to become a part of the culture in order to succeed. So let's start with kind of where do we get started with this whole thing? It sounds like a, a pretty big deal. So let's kind of break it down into steps and figure out how we need to get started on that. So a strategy always starts with that vision that we've talked about. And I mentioned before that the vision statement is, should be inspirational. It should be aspirational, memorable, concise, clear, and really easy to communicate. You know, you hear about the elevator pitch and how you need to be able to, you know, really state that really quickly. Well, the same is true with this. It needs to be something that's very easy to understand, something that anybody looking in could easily see and understand. It needs to paint a picture of the future of the company and what it wants to create, what the organization really wants to become. It should also incorporate the company's values and it needs to be ambitious but attainable. One way to get started with creating this vision statement is to create something called a vision board um, or something like it. So that, that's an exercise that incorporates kind of brainstorming with the visuals that get all those creative juices flowing that you need in order to um, get the right vision statement out there. So you might ask questions like, what does success mean to us? So if we can project down the road and we've really gone where we want to go, then what does that mean to us? What do we want to be? If we're a nonprofit, who are we trying to serve? Or if we're an organization, what problem are we trying to, or, you know, company, what problem are we trying to solve? And what, what are we really doing to kind of to make the world a better place? Um, we also need to talk about what's important to us. So these are things that are getting back to our values. We want to hear about what, what is important to us as a company. So some companies value transparency, others maybe not so much. Um, you might have um, organizations that value innovation, software companies or technology companies that value innovation and really have higher risk tolerances around that and encourage people to step outside of their comfort zone and make decisions and, and to take risks in order to move the company forward. And that's that's perfectly valid in those organizations. You might have another organization where public safety is a concern. You don't really want innovation being present in an organization like that because we don't want people taking risks when, um, when people's safety is, is an issue. Um, so it's really what's, where are we in those spectrums and, and really defining what is important to us. Another great thing about this exercise is it gets everybody on the same page. Um, you have different owners, different founders, different leaders across the organization, board members, other governing bodies, um, and people kind of sit back and have their own ideas about things. And if you don't talk about those, you might find that you're, you might never find that you're not on the same page and you're working towards different goals. 
We also want to talk about what are our unique talents? What do we have to offer that our competition or that others in the organiz or others in our industry may not? Or what are the talents that we can offer that are going to help people um, that we're interested in, in helping and what's going to move our cause forward? And then what are the characteristics of the relationships that you want to have with your stakeholders? So um, are you partnering with other organizations and really um, having that partnership or are you having the client um, client vendor relationship with people? So really who do you want to how do you want to um, define yourself as an organization within your own? ecosystem. So those are just a couple of questions that you can ask. There are many others that you could come up with that would really allow you to kind of brainstorm those things and get the information out there. And you really want to get input on these things from everyone. So this isn't something that you want to do in a boardroom and just have, have board members or senior leaders present and, and just come up with these things. Really, it's important to talk to everybody, down to customers perhaps, employees on the front line, anyone who's willing to listen and provide genuine feedback. Because in the end, that vision statement should really ignite passion in leaders and employees and customers and stakeholders. Um, some organizations share this vision externally with anyone, put it on their website first thing. Others kind of keep it a little bit closer, and it's interesting to think of um, the different uh, reasons for that and why some organizations have, have it closely guarded and others do not, but, um, but it's really a decision that you want to make up front. So let's look at some real life examples of some great vision statements. So Google is one that comes to mind first. Google's vision statement, and right there on their website is, is to provide access to the world's information in one click. So it's a very concise statement. Um, it lets us know a lot of things about the company. Google's most popular product is, of course, its search engine. So that enables people to easily access information from all around the world. We all use Google all the time. This vision statement has three components to it. So they talk about the world's information, they talk about accessibility, and they talk about one click. So they fulfill the first part, the world's information, by crawling all of the web pages they do, and then they maintain databases that contain indexes of those websites. That's how they answer your questions or fulfill your request. So that takes us to fulfill. So they fulfill the accessibility by offering search engines to everyone around the world. It's not just offered to certain people. Anybody who can, can get to a, the internet can get to Google. And then they fulfill the one click by making their search engine easy to use. There's a very, um, it's very intentional that the screen is mostly all white with just one bar in the middle. It's um, there so that you can easily get to the information that you need. Um, another is Amazon. Amazon's vision is to be Earth's most customer-centric company, to build a place where people can come to find and discover anything they may want to buy online. So this vision statement underscores Amazon's main goal of becoming the best e-commerce company in the world. They emphasize three key points in their vision statement also. Those things are global reach, they name Earth as their market, customer prioritization, and a wide selection of products. So we know a little bit about how they're going to um, exist in their market um, and what they're trying to do. The next one is Zappos. So Zappos is a little bit different. Um, theirs is one day 30% of all retail transactions in the US will be online. People will buy from the company with the best service and the best selection, and Zappos.com will be that online store. This is an example of a vision of the product or service that's kind of changing the world. So I, I put these two here because Amazon's vision is based on convenience. They talk about having the widest selection of products. But if you've ever experienced, used Amazon, I use Amazon all the time, I think a lot of us probably do, it's not easy to get in touch with them. It's not easy to call them if you have a question. That's not what they're competing on. They're competing on the fact that you can get anything you want to find there. Whereas Zappos, who I've also interacted with quite a bit, there's service. That's what they're all about, and they, they clearly state it right here, that they want to have the best service and the best selection there is. They're great. You can call them and talk to them about anything, and, and that's part of their philosophy and their mission is to, to provide that best service. So it's clearly stated right here so that if you're an employee and you're coming in, you know what it's all about. You know that this is your expectation and what it's all about. Next, we have Make-A-Wish Foundation. Our vision is that people everywhere will share the power of a wish. That's very inspirational. Um, NPR, 
NPR, with its network of independent member stations, is America's preeminent news institution. So this is an example of a statement that is actually, you know, this is where they want to be when they get there. This is the statement that they want to make. So in our airline simulation, had we taken the time to create a vision statement, we may have started by asking ourselves, what does success mean to us? So after brainstorming and getting our ideas down, we can start to group those thoughts together. So we have a, you imagine the whiteboard or the sticky notes on the wall and just kind of putting everything up there. And then you can usually really take a look and group things together into three or four themes that, that you'll notice are prominent. So they'll be different in every individual case, but usually you're able to draw some parallels between the different items on the list. In our case, um, in this example, success means that we have um, happy employees. It means that um, we have customers that are, are raving fans. And it means that um, we have the latest technology. It means that um, customers are able to use their time wisely. Um, and it means that we are profitable and we have positive cash flow. So now that we've got that kind of down and organized in our minds, we might go next to what is important to us. So if we do the same thing, um, that again, this one helps us articulate our values somewhat, we can group those things together and we notice that, again, we've got the happy employees here. Um, we, we value being a trusted provider. And um, of course, again, the happy customers are important to us. So I very quickly, you know, put these things together. This is an exercise that could take, you know, hours, days to come up with and really have an honest view of the organization, um, where it falls short, where it wants to be, where it wants to improve, what it can provide, and all of those questions. So after all of that introspection and really a lot more work than this, um, but putting all the information together, we can come up with a vision statement from that. So from all of those things that we just looked at, maybe we could come up with this vision statement that says, our airline is the business traveler's transportation of choice. We get passengers to their destinations and back home to their families quickly and easily, all the while allowing them to make the most of their travel time. So the three components that we chose to include here are transportation of choice. So that's about having those raving fans who are coming back for more. We also talk about getting passengers home to their families quickly and easily. That's about the consistency and the efficiency. We want predictable travel times and, um, and we want things to go as expected. We don't want out of the ordinary things to happen. And then finally, making the most of travel time. So that is what we might have chosen to be our differentiator. It's about providing productivity tools for passengers. So really, you know, when you're traveling for business, being able to use all of that time, you know, you're going to have to wait somewhat in airports and, and lines and things like that. But allowing the travelers to do, to make the most of that time and to be as productive as they can be. But note that we what we did not include, we didn't put anything about the happy employees that we talked about because that's because we believe that uh, loyal employees are a driver that help us achieve our goal of the happy customers. So we don't necessarily need to include that. That might be a part of the fabric of our organization that helps drive our success, but not necessarily part of our vision statement. And we also didn't include anything about profitability because that is a result of being the business trainer travelers transportation of choice and we don't want to tie our vision to financial results we talked about those things a few moments ago but really the profitability in um, in our organization is is an end result it's a it's a result of doing what we are trying to do in the best way possible so I'm going to go, we talked about our vision quite a bit, and I'm going to throw in a poll question here and um, ask, does your organization communicate its vision? So is it internally, internally and externally? You don't know. We don't have one. So Joanne, I'll turn it back over to you for a minute. Okay. So go ahead and launch the poll. If you could all take a couple of seconds and let us know where you are. Hmm. All right, let's give just a few more seconds to let the last few people vote. Okay, so I'm going to close the poll here and I'm going to share the results. 
Okay, so 50-50 split <laughs> between A and B and no one for C and D. <laughs> Jennifer? Okay, well that's interesting to see. Well, I'm glad that everyone has a vision and, and knows what it is and some are internally and some are externally. So that's really what good to see that, that everybody kind of knows what their organization's vision is. So that's good news. Okay, so let's, okay, so back to your presentation. Okay. Okay, so the, the next thing we need to do after we have our vision all worked out and, and down on paper and communicating it, um, we need to pull out our strategic themes. So strategic, strategic themes are kind of like load-bearing walls in a house. So they're the pillars that are holding up the strategy, but we don't necessarily see them explicitly stated in the end result. So they're kind of things that you might put on big sticky notes on the wall or, or on your computer so that you kind of have that in mind, but you don't necessarily um, explicitly state it. So in our case, we can look at our vision and, and I can see two themes that we need to pull out from here. So one theme might be or operational excellence. So um, getting passengers to their destination and back quickly and easily. In order to achieve that, we need to really focus on that operational excellence and being sure that we have all of our processes in place, that we have the convenience in place that's going to help the passengers get to and from. And then also a theme of allowing them to make the most of their travel time. So um, that has to do with the productivity. It has to do with exceptional um, exceptional customer experience, um, giving them the best experience that they can possibly find. So those are going to be our strategic themes that we're going to incorporate as we're building this balanced scorecard and building the strategy plan throughout. So you'll see as we continue forward how everything kind of has those undertones in it, that that's kind of what we want to do and how we want to get to where we want to be. So once we have our strategic themes designed, we kind of have our framework kind of starting to be built and put into place, we want to talk about perspectives. So perspectives are the lenses through which we're going to define success. So typically our perspectives are going to be customer, or I'm sorry, financial, customer, internal process, and employee, which is also called learning and growth. So that's more of an internal. And those can be modified, they can be changed, they can be specific to your organization. Um, typically, if you have a for-profit organization, um, the learning and growth is kind of the foundational um, part of the scorecard moving up to the processes, then to the customer, and then to financial at the very top of the scorecard. Um, if you're not nonprofit, those are sometimes switched. Sometimes the financial is on the very bottom because that's the foundation driving all of the other forces throughout or sometimes and, and the customer or the, the the people that you serve are going to be at the top of the scorecard and so it really just depends on your organization sometimes people put them side by side that's a great thing about us the balance scorecard methodology is that it is very flexible and can be changed to support your particular organization's needs and it works just as well so once we have our perspectives defined and the lenses through, I mentioned the lenses through which we're defining success. So this is from, um, I mentioned at the beginning that the balance scorecard is about financial and non-financial measures and, and how you can do that. So obviously we're used to hearing um, maybe it's, maybe it's return on investment as a good financial measure that a lot of people are familiar with and look at. Um, and that's something that you can certainly look at and, and say, did the organization succeed if, if this ROI is, is some number, then the organization succeeded. But that's ignoring a lot of the uh, people in the organization. It's ignoring the processes. It's ignoring the customers. So we're going to look at it from all of these perspectives and really define success. So once we have our perspectives, our next step then is to come back and talk about objectives. So in a balanced scorecard, objectives are the key areas that the company need, on which the company needs to focus in order to, to succeed. So the company can take a look at where it is now, where it wants to go, and identify what are the areas that we need to focus on. So identifying objectives really requires that leaders take a hard look at the organization and identify your strengths that you want to capitalize on, but also talk about the weaknesses that you want to overcome. So it's about maybe doing a SWOT analysis, and that's a good place to start. 
So objectives are then grouped into the perspectives and they need to be aligned with each other. And we'll go through some examples of that. And so they're really objectives you can think of as the link that ties the vision with the actual projects or activities that you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So they can be written as declarative statements. So um, we must implement a new technology in order to succeed. That might be an objective, or it can be in the voice of the customer. So you could say from a customer's point of view, um, the organization helped me grow and succeed in, in whatever it is that, that we're in the, the business of doing. So let's start by creating some objectives. So we're gonna start with the learning and growth perspective, and this is kind of the very foundation. So. Um, we need to ask ourselves, how can we sustain our ability to learn and grow? And that's a good starting place always for coming up with objectives in this category. The objectives in this particular perspective are enablers of the other perspectives. So we talked about being knowledge workers. Most of us are knowledge workers and we live in an increasingly knowledge um, sort of driven society. This is where we want to focus on building the intangible assets that drive the success throughout the organization. The intangible assets that we're talking about can be divided into three different areas of capital. We talk about human capital, and that refers to the skills and like the particular talents that are needed within the organization. Informational capital is all about the infrastructure that is needed to kind of support the strategy. You know, today technology is everywhere, so we certainly can't ignore the technology that's needed when it comes to developing a strategy map. And then organizational capital is all about culture. So what do we really need in order to achieve the vision? And is our culture internally aligned with our vision? So after we ask ourselves these questions and talk about these things, some examples of some objectives we might come, come back with. So in human capital, um, we might, remember this as we're talking about the skills and talents needed in our organization. So we might recognize that we need to, to have a continuous learning environment. We need to have um, people who are continually becoming better at what they're doing and people who are learning about new trends and um, say finance or operations or, or wherever they might be. For information capital, we need to talk about increasing knowledge management and information sharing. So we as an organization may recognize that um, it's not only important to learn and get new information, but it's important to be able to really manage that information and share information across the organization, even internally, externally, everywhere. And then for organizational capital, we might talk about a coaching system. So maybe we're not uh, using those performance manage or performance reviews anymore that are kind of backwards looking. Maybe we're going to implement this coaching system that's kind of goal setting goals and more forward looking. So if that might be appropriate for the organization, that would be a great objective to, to set there. So we want to keep these to about um, three to four or even two to four objectives within each perspective because we know we can't do everything at one time. So I mentioned before that this is a, a really a, a breathing, living, breathing document. So it's going to be con constantly changing. So we don't have to try to force ourselves to include absolutely everything in it right now. Um, we can talk about those things that are most important to us right now in order to continue to move the organization forward. So we want to start building our strategy map now. So the learning and growth perspective I mentioned in, in our scorecard is the foundation for, for where we are. So we want to start putting these objectives into this map, the strategy map that we'll continue to build as we're going forward. Next, we have the internal process perspective. So this is what processes must we excel in order to succeed? So we're going to ask ourselves that question and think of the activities and processes kind of from end to end in the life cycle of our customer or those who we are serving. And then we want to identify those processes that are needed to deliver the value proposition. So how we're going to differentiate ourselves, you know, how we're going to exceed, succeed and how are we going to deliver that to the customer. So to help identify those objectives that are the most important in the internal process perspectives, Kaplan and Norton, who were the, the uh, founders of the Balanced Scorecard, suggested that we group the processes into four different categories. 
So we have operations management. That's just kind of the basic day-to-day -day processes that are in place to produce the product or the service that we're delivering. Um, one such process that we might have is excellence in financial management. So financial management is itself a process within the organization. So we need to make sure that um, this is a, an example of an objective would be the excellence in financial management to make sure that we're doing everything that we can. Um, next, we have regulatory and social processes. They help the organization kind of earn the right to operate in their community. So in our case of the airline, an obvious regulatory and social objective would be kind of the safety of both the customers and the employees. Um, so we might have as an objective reducing safety incidents. Next, we have customer management. So this enables us to grow and strengthen our relationship with our customers and prospects who we want to be customers. Um, we know that the traditional way of operating a business just doesn't really work in our digital world because digital is all about connections. People have a, a voice and audiences that are more easily found through social media and other means. So it's really important that, um, that to serve your customers' needs, you need to understand them. So we want to identify those processes that we can use to manage our customer relationships. So we might set an objective that we want high quality service. And finally, innovation processes are those that you use to create new products, services, features, whatever it may be, that help you keep your existing customers and then win new ones. So we're looking for those kind of white spaces, those things that customers say that they want, but then also the things that they want that they don't really know that they want. So being able to get all those together would be a, a great way. Maybe we want to provide more productivity tools for our customers. So these might be examples of our objectives that we set in our, um, in our internal process perspective. And then we're going to kind of lay those on top. Um, some scorecards that you might see or strategy maps that you might see have kind of lines that, that connect one objective with the other. Or you can do it as I'm doing it here and just kind of have them across the organization. Um, we know that objectives need to all objectives need to affect or be affected by another objective. So they are all tied together and they do feed into each other. We just need to keep that in mind as we're going through. So next we're going to move on to the customer perspective. So from this perspective, we want to ask the question of to achieve our vision, how must we look to our customers? So to find out, we need to start by identifying our target market. We need to know who it is that we're trying to serve. And in our case, we're serving business travelers. And then we need to talk about what is our value proposition when we're serving them. So again, remember these perspectives are, you know, we're looking at, at success from the perspectives across the organization. So in this perspective, we're looking at success from the customer standpoint. And our value proposition is reliability and productivity. We've talked about that goes back to our strategic themes of the operational excellence um, and also the, the great service. So um, having those present is really important here. So we might come down to um, objectives of frequent and reliable departures, customer conveniences, and customer loyalty. So let's put those objectives here in the in this perspective and you can see how we're we're building this upwards. And then finally when we reach the financial perspective, we need to ask ourselves what does financial success look like to our stakeholders? So again, depending on where the business is in its life cycle, the financial goals may be different. So companies in a startup or heavy growth phase usually need funds to reinvest. So financial goals may be largely related to, say, retaining cash. But other companies, maybe they've reached maturity and they're more concerned with return on investments. In our case, we might identify our um, financial objectives as increasing profitability and then effective cash flow management. So once we put these on the strategy map, we have an extremely quick um, very high level overview of, of what we're looking at. So the objectives really tell the story of the company's strategy and let everyone know how the company plans to achieve the vision. So in general, improving objectives in the employee perspective enables improvement in objectives in the internal process perspective, which then leads to better performance in the customer and the financial perspective. So you can see how they kind of all work together. This can become a narrative too that could 
anyone who comes into the organization or anyone that you share this with could really get to know um, what is your value proposition and, and even a little bit about your vision and what you want to achieve and, and how you plan to get there. So once we have our objectives mapped out, these are again the areas where we need to succeed in order to achieve our vision. The next step is to identify measures. So we need to have some key performance indicators that tell the company whether the objectives are moving in the right direction. So the important thing to remember about objectives is that they can be, or I'm sorry, measures, is that they can be leading indicators or they can be lagging indicators. So lagging indicators are those key KPIs that follow an event and report on the past event. So once it's already been reported on, you can't affect that. You can't, it is what it is. Net income in a prior period um, is what it is and you're not going to, to change that. Um, leading indicators, on the other hand, are the KPIs that prevent future success or future events. So these are measures that are lower down on the scorecard and the foundational levels like employee engagement. Um, higher levels of employee engagement have been proven to drive improvements and operational results across the rest of the organization. So at the top of the scorecard, you're going to have mostly lagging indicators. And as you move down to the, to the bottom of the scorecard, they're going to be increasingly leading. And one way to think about leading versus lagging indicators is um, an example of if you decide that you want to lose five pounds over the next month. Um, you've set a goal. You have your vision there. If you step on the scale at the end of the month and you see that you either succeeded or you didn't succeed, and that's fine, that's a lagging indicator. But if every day you're counting your calories and writing down your exercise and activity, those are leading indicators that are going to, going to predict your future success. So if you see you're not moving in the right direction with your leading indicators, you can, you, they're more agile. You can shift and change in order to um, positively affect the, the outcome or the lagging indicators. So once we decide how we're going to measure and how we're going to define success or, or, or numerically define if, if we're achieving our success, now we get to the initiatives. Initiatives are those projects, those, you know, it's kind of like where the rubber meets the road. It's the projects or activities that are implemented to move the objectives forward. It's with this step that strategy is truly translated into action. Oops. So when we come down to, um, to initiatives and measures, so these might be some examples. So we talked about in the learning and growth perspective, we want to increase knowledge management and information sharing. So some examples here might be um, that we are going to implement an accelerant. Um, we're going to be able to share information from across the organization. We're going to be able to get inputs from all of our department managers on um, budgetary needs or, or things that factors that go into creating the budget. And then the measure on this might just be a simple was it implemented timely or not? It doesn't have to be really complicated. Um, sometimes it's just a yes or no, was it or was it not? Um, another example of financial management. So we talked about how um, excellence in financial management might be a good internal process objective. So we might have an initiative to utilize collaborative budgeting in order to improve our financial management. So our measure then might be plan variance versus actual. So you can see how you can come back and actually have these initiatives. You may have initiatives that support multiple objectives across the organization. This is also a great way once you have all of your initiatives mapped out and these are how you're going to move these objectives in the right direction and then how you're going to measure your success in doing so, um, it's a good way to prioritize. It's a good way to look and say, okay, this initiative is supporting multiple objectives across the organization, so we better push that up on our priority list and, and get to that really quickly. So those are, are ways that you can actually continue to move your company forward in the right direction and really systematically do that. So now that we've had a very high level overview of kind of what the balance scorecard is and how you might create one, I'm curious, um, so we have another poll question here, I'm curious if your organization actually has a balance scorecard. So maybe yes, no, sort of, or I don't know. So I'll turn it back over to you, Joanne. Okay. All right, so let's, the poll is launched. 
and let's see for our participants what they think about what's happening in their own organization. So let me just give a few more seconds. Okay, I'll close the poll and let me share that. Okay. So there you go. People know That's for sure if they have one or not. <laughs> That's interesting. So we've got a, you know, kind of a good mix of yes, no, and, and more of sort of. So I can understand the sort of. I know that there are a lot of variations and a lot of different ways that people can do this. It really is a guideline and a framework. So uh, it's good to see that a lot of people, yes, and sort of have one. So, um, so with that, let me um, talk a little bit about kind of um, balanced scorecard and and budgeting and you know really why we're we're here today the reality is really that many organizations don't actually execute their strategy well intentioned most are well intentioned but um, you know strategy execution is a really hard thing to get right and one reason um, that organizations often don't execute their strategy is that they face resource barriers so they don't link budgets with the strategy, which really puts up those roadblocks. So sometimes budgets are seen as obstacles to overcome rather than management tools, as I'm sure most everyone here knows. And the balance scorecard does one really important thing when it comes to strategic resource allocation. It really sets those priorities and provides companies with a you know, a strong rationale that everyone can see for where to focus resources. So if you have competing, you know, competing projects, um, it might be that it's easier for the person who's, who's, priority is not or whose priority is put lower on the list to see well I can understand that because that project on, in that other department is really driving success and, and we all need to rally around and get behind that so it's a framework that can help managers that are struggling with too many projects competing for too few resources actually see the kind of the bigger picture and the greater good and a balance scorecard can also help overcome that resource barrier if you tie specifically the budgeting and the strategic planning process together. So you have to remember that the human and the financial resources that are needed in order to achieve all of those objectives should be driving the budget rather than creating the budget by taking last year's numbers and adding 5%. So it's about really basing that budget and reality and making it more attainable and um, more able to help the company move forward. And that's really why I'm a big fan of Accelerant because it is a tool to engage people from across the entire organization in the budgeting process and then actually empowering them to make those decisions because that's important not just for budgetary success but also for strategic execution. So it's been said that a failure is a success if you learn from it. So I learned from my airline simulation experience and many, many others along the way. So one lesson that I've, I've learned that really has stuck with me is kind of prevalent in everything that I do is that a team of engaged employees is really a critical factor that can drive sustainable success. But they have to have a framework in which to make those decisions. And the balanced scorecard strategic planning and management methodology is one way that companies can really communicate that vision and the story of the strategy in the form of that strategy map. So a balanced scorecard can take many months to implement and it requires a big commitment from those at the top, but leaders need to have an open mind and be ready to kind of embark on this exercise of organizational self-discovery. But once you do have the balanced scorecard successfully implemented and embedded in the culture, it can really serve as a much needed pathway to success in achieving your company's vision. So Joanne, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay. Well, thank you, Jennifer, for another very interesting and practical webinar. And we love asking Jennifer to present, obviously because she brings great insight and information on thought leadership, but also because, because our philosophies align so closely. So at Accelerant, we strongly believe that engaging um, department managers successfully in the budgeting process is possibly the single most important element in achieving a budget that's aligned with your strategic plan. Because at the end of the day, when your employees are empowered to outline their ideas for the wisest uses of funds, 
explain their reasoning and have a discussion with you and the senior management about available resources and expectations. They really do own their numbers and they take accountability for their decisions. And this increase in their ownership and accountability improves accuracy and helps to ensure that the budget is truly a numerical expression of the strategic plan. And this is ultimately what all organizations, corporate, nonprofit, or higher education are really hoping for and the mission we're here to support at Accelerant. So you can find um, some more resources on effective collaboration budgeting strategies, employee engagement, and executing on strategy on our website, accelerant.com. And it's time to just wrap up and see if anyone has any questions. So a few questions came in during the webinar, and I guess we could probably answer two or three of them. So the first one, Jennifer, is how long does a balanced scorecard take to develop and implement? Okay, that's a great question. I can promise it takes more than the 45 minutes or so that we, ha we had today. So there's really a couple of different um, levels of balanced scorecard. You should start with the top level or the enterprise level. Sometimes it's called a tier one balanced scorecard. And that's going to probably take two to three months to implement to really have the discussions that you need. I find that when I help companies um, implement these, typically what's going to happen is we're going to have that brainstorming session. You're going to get down all the information and everybody's going to walk away in the next week. Somebody's going to say, well, no, that doesn't feel quite right. We need to revisit that. So it really is keeping asking why and continuing until you get everything right. So I would allow at least two to three months for that. And then you also probably want to have, depending on the size and, and complexity of your organization, cascading scorecards. So those would be business unit or department, um, product line, you know, any, any way that you can um, can kind of separate the different functions in your organization. And those can take an extra even three to six more months after that. Because not only do you have to create the scorecard, this is really a change management process. You have to have leadership development. You have to have communication strategies and planning and those sorts of things. So you want to have a cross-functional team that's really guided by someone who is well-versed in, in this methodology to, to get it done. But definitely you know, six months minimum in order to get that really facilitated. So following up with that, once that's all done, how does one then ensure that the balanced scorecard is maintained in the long run? Well, it's about really instilling that into the culture. And it's not just you know building the methodology, but it's continuously reporting on the results, having everyone involved, you know, having the balanced scorecard meetings where you're reporting um, what's happening and um, educating everyone involved on how to do it. So it's all about continuous improvement and a changing environment. So it's really a journey, you know, they say it's never a destination, it's always a journey, and, and that's very true here. So the key is to maintain the strategic alignment to the mission and the vision, and then kind of the, the long-term strategic results. So because that mission and vision are not likely to change, you kind of have to pivot around those and, and react to things that are happening in your own industry or environment and addressing those unforeseen actions. So it's really about, um, I guess the answer really is to instill it into the culture and continuously revisit it and make decisions based on it. Okay, we're at the just about the top of the hour, so we hope you all enjoyed today's webinar, and thank you, Jennifer, for a fantastic presentation. It was informative and practical, and you can contact us at info at accelerant.com if you wish to have a discussion about how our product can support and encourage budgeting for strategy in your organization. And thank you, everyone, for taking the time today to listen to our Accelerant Thought Leadership Series webinar on strategy execution with a balanced scorecard. Have a great rest of your day.